Right, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, um, good morning, everyone. I will talk about an Agda library that I've developed together with uh, Andreas and uh, Dominique de Vriese, and that, uh, that we've called Sickle. <laughs> so, yeah, what's the, what's the purpose of this library? Well, in the literature, you can find many extensions um, of, a, of a standard type theory like Martin Leuf type theory or calculus of constructions that, uh, well, that extends such a, a standard type theory with new primitives um, that allow you to write more programs or prove more properties than would be possible in the original theory. And so I've included some, uh, some examples of such extensions in this slide. But the problem is that many of these type systems are only described on paper, and we actually want to use these new primitives when programming or proving in a, in a dependent typed language like Agda or Coq. And so SQL is, a, is in fact a first step towards, towards that goal. So here you can see a, a brief overview of, uh, of our library. So as you can see, SQL consists of three layers. And the first layer is a, is a syntactic layer. It's, um, it provides a deeply embedded syntax of what we call multi-mode simple type theory, but more on that later. So at this layer, you can write your program um, in this syntax, and the program can make use of the new primitives you want. What you cannot do at this layer is um, evaluate a program. So there's no notion of computation at this layer. But you can compute the denotation of a program in the second semantic layer. So that layer consists of, um, of a formalization of pre-sheaf models of type theory in Agda. And so the bridge between these two layers is formed by a, by a, a type checker that, when successful, will immediately give you the denotation of your program in the, at the semantic layer. And then the, um, the notation of some programs can actually be further extracted to ordinary Agda programs. So in that way, you get just a normal Agda function that you can import and, uh, and use in, uh, in other Agda developments that do not necessarily make use of SQL. Right, so what is this multi-mode simple type theory, or MSTT? Well, actually, it's, uh, it's a restriction of uh, multimodal type theory, or MTT, by, uh, by Kratzer and others. Um, but restricted to simple types. So at the, cement, uh, at the syntactic layer, there is uh, currently no support for dependent types. And just like MTT, MSTT is parameterized by a mode theory, which is basically just a, a small two category. And today, I won't even talk about two cells, so you can just think of it as a, as a small category. And um, the objects of such a mode theory are called modes, and the morphisms are called modalities. And so at every single mode, MSTT will provide a complete type system with functions, pairs, natural numbers, etc. And the modalities will give rise to new primitive type constructors to transport types and terms um, from one mode to the other. So more concretely, if we have a modality mu from mode M to a mode N, we, for instance, get um, a modal type constructor that takes a type T at mode M and produces a type mu T at mode N. And in the reverse direction, we get also a lock operation on contexts, which you can think of as a, as a left adjoint of this, um, of this modal type constructor. So what does a program in SQL look like? Well, suppose that we have the following um, mode theory with, uh, with three modes and two modalities. And now we want to construct a function of the following type. So here, this circled M is, um, is composition of modalities. And so a function of this type is kind of an applicative operator for the modality kappa restricted to modal functions of type mu a to b. So what we need to do is, well, we have this empty context, and we want to construct a function of, uh, of, of this type. So it's a modal function. So we're going to use um, modal uh, lambda abstraction. And the effect of this is that we um, extend our context with a new variable. And as you can see in, uh, in MSTT, every variable appears in the context under a certain modality. So here, it's under the modality kappa. So now we need to produce um, still an, uh, a modal function. So again, we use modal lambda abstraction, but this time with the composition of, uh, of kappa mu as modality, and we extend our context again. And then we um, want to construct a term of type kappa b, which we can do um, using the modal constructor mod kappa. Um, and the effect of that is that um, we need to give a term of type b, but we lock our context with the modality kappa. So we end up in this situation. And so to produce a term of type b, we actually want to apply this function f to a. But we cannot do that directly, because f is a modal function. So we use modal function application. 
And the effect of that is that the argument will be type checked in a context locked with the modality mu. So now we end up in this situation. And now for hole number zero, we want to use this, this function f, this variable. But in MSTT, before we can use a variable, we uh, must verify one condition. And th that is that the modality under which that variable appears must be equal to the composition of all the logs to the right of that modality. So here, the variable f appears under the modality kappa. <coughs> And there is only one lock to the right of, uh, of f, which is also of modality kappa. So indeed, we can use the variable f here. And the same goes for hole number one. We want to use the variable a. It appears under modality kappa composed with mu, which is exactly the composition of the two locks to the right of a. OK, so now we have a, have a program written in MSTT, or well, written in SQL. What can we actually do with it? Um, well, to illustrate that, I'm going to use um, a concrete uh, application that we've um, developed in SQL, and that's uh, guarded recursion. So here you can, um, at the top, you can see um, a mode theory for guarded recursion with two modes and a couple of modalities, among which the later modality. Um, and now, at the semantic layer, types will be interpreted as pre-sheaves, so basically diagrams of Agda, function, uh, Agda types and Agda functions. And the shape of such a diagram or the base category of the pre-sheaf model, will be determined by the mode of the type. So for instance, uh, types at mode star will be interpreted as just an ordinary Agda type. And types at mode omega will be interpreted as a sequence of Agda types and Agda functions, as you can see uh, on the right. And now we can also implement um, operations that transform one diagram into another, and which will correspond to the different modalities in our mode theory. So this um, allows us to really interpret um, and the entire MSTT with this mode theory in, at, the, at the semantic layer. And what we can also see is that um, a type at mode star will be interpreted as just an ordinary Agda type, and a term will be just interpreted as an ordinary Agda term. And this makes it really easy to um, extract types and terms um, at mode star to just ordinary Agda types and terms. You could think it's trivial, but there is some difficulty, which I won't give uh, any details about uh, during this talk. But uh, yeah, this makes it easy, and this gives us a, a really elegant extraction mechanism um, that allows us to stay as long as possible at the syntactic layer where we write our programs, and if you end up with a program that's of the wrong mode, you can just apply a modality, um, you're in mode star, compute the denotation, and then extract to an, uh, an ordinary Agda function. OK, so as a, as a summary, what's the um, benefits of using SQL? So first, it's completely general in the mode theory. Um, we also illustrate that in the full paper with uh, another application involving a, a restricted form of parametricity. It has this extraction mechani mechanism using modalities, um, which I already talked about. And then um, it has this certain modular use of um, type theory extensions. Um, so basically, the syntax is just uh, an inductive type parameterized by a mode theory. Um, so if at one point um, in your Agda development you want to um, use guarded recursion to write a function, um, you can just instantiate SQL with a mode theory for guarded recursion, write for a function, extract it to an ordinary Agda function. And if at another point you want to use um, parametricity, you can instantiate SQL with a mode theory for parametricity, extract um, to an ordinary Agda function, and keep on working in, uh, in ordinary Agda. Some of the limitations is that, well, our syntax is just an inductive data type, so we cannot use, make use of some convenient um, Agda um, features like implicits. And we do not support um, substructural systems like linear typing or, well, any of the systems from the previous talk, I guess. Um, right, so um, what I'm currently working about on is, um, well, not um, extending MSTT to dependent types, but adding a logical framework. Um, so there you get a, a way to write proofs about SQL programs. And I need to mention that the pre sheaf models, so the semantic layer, already do support dependent types, so we can write a soundness proof. And so the hope is that we get um, we can extract those, the, 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 the interpretations of the pr those proofs to get ordinary Agda proofs about the extracted SQL programs. And so very, very quickly uh, about future work, um, I hope to implement the Hoffmann-Streicher universe at, a, at the semantic layer, but there are some problems in standard Agda which I hope to solve 
if, uh, well, which I think I could solve if there would be a, a variant of cubicle ACTA with uniqueness of identity proofs. Um, I also want to extend the, the syntactic layer to full dependent types, provide some support for inductive types, and study other applications. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude, so thank you. Do you use cubical agda to formalize prefix? Uh, no, no, uh, standard agda. Okay, then do you use function extensionality? I do, I yeah. do, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the pre-shift layer, well, how much of pre-shift theory do you um, do you formalize that? Do you, do you need to talk about the naturality diagrams and do you use propositional equality for that? Um, so yes, um, so I, I do reason about this, these naturality diagrams and, and indeed um, we use propositional uh, equality um, but the, for, for many things, but like not for instance for um, equality of, of pre-sheaves for instance. So, so it, it's split in, into levels. So if you need to um, reason about, for instance, um, reason about the equality of pre-sheaves, we actually use uh, natural isomorphisms because that behaves much nicer than, uh, than, than the propositional <laughs> equality. Okay. But inside, if you, for instance, in, in the definition of a pre-sheaf, you also have like, certain naturality requirements, and there we use propositional equality. Okay, I'm just wondering if there's an overhead working with that rather than, you know, if you could formulate it using... Yeah, 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 so there, there, there is, yeah, and actually we've considered using cubicle agda, but at this point that would like take quite some work to, to port it to, to cubicle agda, so uh, yeah. Did you consider using um, uh, strict pre-sheaves, like Pierre Marie's pre sets, where you don't need to function extensionality? Mm. Or uh, there are these point-free pre-sheaves, where you, that's another way to avoid function extensionality, which are not strict, but still uh, uh, maybe a bit nice. Mm, we, yeah. we maybe we can discuss that. that, that yeah, could be, well, yeah, well they're, yeah, they're not included, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.